So we'll be starting in about 30 seconds for those of you or who have just joined us uh, via Instagram as well as via Facebook.com. At this point in time, I'd like to go ahead and introduce um, to all of you Dr. Neil Gardner, chiropractic neurologist at Gardner Chiropractic and Neurology, who has been looking on the matter of COVID-19. And uh, um, without any further ado, we begin our town hall as we take a look at COVID-19, protecting yourself and the vulnerable. Good evening, everyone. And um, it is indeed a pleasure that we are able to be here to conduct the first town hall session, virtual town hall. Um, it is my hope that the information that is shared today will be of certainly of some benefit to everyone who is participating. Um, we are in very difficult times right now. A lot of persons are fearful, they are apprehensive, and as a consequence of that fear and apprehension, many persons have been feeling isolated, feeling um, down, some people are going to depression and so forth. But it is with the understanding that knowledge empowers us and knowledge helps us to make it through any situation that I seek to share some information with the general public that's probably not otherwise available and hopefully it is going to be meaningful. Now, I thank you that you're patient with us while we try to take care of some teething matters, but as it is the first time we're conducting this, eventually, uh, if we have to do it again, I'm sure we'll be doing it several fold better. Um, we'll be passing the mic across to each other, and it's just one of those things where we have to help each other out and be there for each other. Now, what I share comes from a person who is not a medical doctor. I'm a chiropractic neurologist, and so there will be some persons that will have some objections to, you know, why it is that we're doing this. Uh, one such objection is that, you know, why not leave this to the medical providers to share this information? Well, I think it's important that we get information from as many different sources as possible. And this is how we studied when we were in school. But the important thing is making sure that the information is credible. And so much of what I will be sharing here tonight is standard information that is well understood. Some have very good science backing it, but some the science is lacking as a result of the nature of um, some of the testing that is required. Um, another one is, it is not a proven remedy for COVID-19. And we hear this objection being banded around whenever we hear persons speaking about natural remedies. And doctors often say, and you know, other healthcare professionals, well, we don't have any science backing it, so why should we, we are not going to accept it. The problem is that we are dealing with a new situation. COVID-19 is a novel infection. It's caused by the novel SARS coronavirus 2. Um, and as such, no remedy, no treatment that is actually being offered right now, whether it is as a part of mainstream or not, no treatment has any proven efficacy. And so everything that I share will at least be equal in validity to whatever is already out there. However, there are certain things that I will share that is widely accepted and is being used more and more, even in hospitals in different parts of the world, and I will share that information with you. The concern about fake news is also important, and I want persons to realize that it is something that I take very seriously as well. And so whenever I'm doing my research, I'm not just looking at Facebook pages or WhatsApp posts. I'm trying to look for the underlying um, documents that support, the literature that supports um, the information that's there, peer-reviewed peer journals, if possible, and other types of inquiries that will make certainly the discussion here as robust as possible. Another objection we hear is that you cannot stop COVID-19 using natural remedies. 
And so let's just put things into perspective and make sure that everybody understands right away that the goal here is not to stop COVID-19 with any remedy, nor am I trying to insinuate that there is a treatment that I'm going to offer tonight or a recommendation that I'm going to offer that's going to be able to stop COVID-19. The reality is that it is the body's own immune system that is able to overcome the effects of the coronavirus. And so whatever I'll be sharing, primarily it's with relation to how can we build the body's immune system so that it can better ward off not just infections in general, but this particular type of infection. So God is in control. God is in control. And so 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, For he did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so we are stepping out boldly, understanding that we have the victory in Christ Jesus. And I say that from a Christian standpoint, because that is my worldview. And persons who have their own worldviews, they will say their own thing. But I make no apologies for it because this is what keeps us through and keeps us in the fight. And so it is with that in mind that I know that in the end, the human race will be victorious over this thing. And so there's no need for us to panic or fear or have any dread. Thank you, Dr. Gardner. I guess um, at some point we want to find out uh, the difference between COVID-19 and what is co being called SARS-CoV-2, this very technical name. Could you please explain to our listeners? Okay, so I guess the easiest analogy to use to explain the difference between SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, because you hear people use both terms, but they're not interchangeable terms. They have their specific meanings. So COVID-19 is the disease that's caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2. SARS stands for the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, which first occurred in 2003 by SARS-CoV-1, which was also a coronavirus in Asia. Um, and that virus caused an epidemic, not a pandemic, as this one is. This one is way more infectious than that first one, and it has claimed already several more lives than that first one. In fact, in the first month of this one being around, it claimed more lives. And so it's, it's important that people understand, you know, we have to do everything in our power to help each other. So SARS-CoV-2 is the second SARS coronavirus um, that we know of, and hence SARS-CoV for coronavirus 2. Uh, COVID-19 is the name of the disease that's caused by the coronavirus, COVID, D for the disease. 19 stands for the year in which it first emerged, um, and that was 2019. So SARS-CoV-2 is the virus itself that causes the disease COVID-19. Thank you so much. So before, earlier, as we advertised this particular program, we asked persons to submit their questions. And Nadine Guy wanted to find out, what can I do to boost my immune system? And uh, along that same line, we had Jamaica Natural Hair Festival wanting to find out what specific foods should the elderly people be given at this time since their immune system, are, uh, system would, be, would not be as strong as it used to be. And any recommendations for diabetics and those persons who might be suffering from hypertension? Okay, um, I'll speak to hypertension and diabetes later on because that's a different discussion that I think warrants its own airtime. And I, I'll try my best to, I mean, we can stay on here as long as we need to, um, but we'll be, <coughs> but we'll be, you know, we started a little bit late. We'll try to get the most out of it. Um, okay, so as far as the elderly is concerned and what foods can we recommend? The first thing is that anything that is good for the body is good to consume. Now, when we say that, I mean that we want to get as many foods, food types that are non-processed. The more organically we can eat, the better, because every toxin that we introduce into our bodies will, with it, cause um, 
some load that the body will have a hard time dealing with. And so it is important that we try to eat as organically as possible from the earth as much as possible. Now, there was a recommendation made by, I think, the Jamaican Agricultural um, Society. I'm not sure if that's the name of the group. But the farmers were saying they have produce that are going to waste. They have so much produce that they have to probably throw, it, throw some away. They're asking the government to assist in procuring some of them for those who are in quarantine and those who are elderly. I think it will be very important and, and a very good way for the government to, certainly in Jamaica, to try to mobilize the collection of these food types and to offer it to persons free of charge, I would say, especially those who are in government quarantines and especially to those who are um, in need. So that's, the, that's a very important thing. Um, most of your foods, I would say that the majority of people don't have enough servings of fruits and vegetables. And so we would recommend a wide variety of fruits and vegetables for each person, myself included. Um, and we recommend during the time of crisis, eight servings per day of fresh fruits and vegetables. So that's, that's a whole lot. Um, it's impossible for some of us to eat that much. Um, so juicing is important, blending, making smoothies, uh, making your green juices and so forth will be very important. And we'll make some specific recommendations later on as it relates to some of the items that we can use to um, help boost our immune system. Because we're going to be moving on perhaps to some other matters. All right, I'm going to bring up a slide here. All right, so I'm going to bring up this slide to speak to some of those recommendations. And these recommendations were from a recipe that was given to us by uh, Dr. Deborah Williams. So we thank her for that, um, those recipes. And so I'm recommending that you all take notes where possible. I'm sorry we don't have the overhead visible or the projector visible for everyone, but here it is. But we're going to post it um, and post links to it on our page. Uh, aloe vera. There's an aloe vera remedy that is, and this is not a remedy for COVID, this is to boost your immune system. Everything that we're sharing is to boost your immune system, not to treat COVID-19. So please don't get, me, go, don't get that wrong. So the aloe vera remedy is to first cut three inches of aloe vera, and you may keep on the skin, but cut off the sharp parts. Blend those in four ounces of coconut water, freshly squeezed orange juice or grapefruit juice, and then strain off the liquid, because there's a lot of fiber in it, and you will have that drink every morning, 30 minutes before your first cooked meal for that day. So that's the aloe vera remedy. Three inches of aloe vera stalk, cutting off the sharp parts, keep the skin on, blend it with four ounces of coconut water, freshly squeezed orange juice, or grapefruit juice, and drinking that, having strained off the liquid 30 minutes before you eat. Uh, guinea hen weed. There's a nice guinea hen weed um, recipe, and it goes like this. You will add half a, tea, half a teaspoon of guinea hen root and half a teaspoon of guinea hen leaf. So when you have the guinea hen, you have the root and the leaf. So you'll use both parts. Dry the herb. Um, add, eight ounces, add to eight ounces of boiling water. So you'll boil the water first and then add to eight ounces of the water and let it simmer. So you'll reduce the heat and let it simmer for three minutes. Remove it from the heat and let it steep or draw for 10 to 15 minutes. And then you will strain off the fibrous parts and drink. Ideally, you'll drink it straight, but you may add honey to reduce the difficulty in making it palatable. Um, because it's not very palatable for some. Um, and this can be a tea that you'll have every morning. Moringa leaf. Now, the moringa plant or the moringa tree is a miracle food. It has protein, minerals, vitamins, amino acids. It actually has and is one of the fr few fruits, a uh, few vegetable or non-animal sources that will give us 
our entire spectrum of essential amino acids. And so it's important that we start to utilize Moringa. Um, the leaf can be eaten, the pods can be eaten, the bark has healing properties for skin. But as far as what we're going to recommend here, you can take one teaspoon of Moringa powder, you can buy the powder itself or you can make it yourself. To make the powder, you will collect some of the leaves, dry the leaves, uh, put it on a mesh or a zinc or something where no water has access to it and let it dry. You can let it dry in the sun or let it just dry out for a couple of days. Once it's dry, you can put it in your blender and blend it fine to a fine powder. That is the same Moringa powder that you'll buy in the stores, so it makes it cheaper. You will add eight ounces of coconut water, one teaspoon of the Moringa powder to eight ounces of the coconut water. Then you will add one teaspoon each of the following, flax seed, pumpkin seed, sunflower seed, and sesame seed. You will also add to that mixture one teaspoon or one tablespoon of wheat grass powder. So you get the wheat grass and you'll blend it or you'll just buy the powder and you'll put all of that together. Mix up all the ingredients, blend up all the ingredients into a smoothie and use that to start your morning. It's a wonderful way to kickstart your immune boosting morning and we thank Dr. Williams again for sharing this recipe with us and hopefully it will be of benefit. Thank you, Dr. Gardner. And just to reiterate that if you didn't get all of this information, you can go to our website at www.gcnjamaica, spell out the entire word, jamaica.com. So that's G as in Gardner, C as in chiropractic, and N as in neurology gcnjamaica.com and right there on our homepage you'll see the boost your immune system or COVID-19 resources and once you click there you'll find all of what was mentioned just now. Okay so, so, so as to continue with the matter of immune boosting there are a few things that is important when you're boosting your immune system and one cannot discount or put on the back burner the importance of the spiritual aspect of it. And so we will highly recommend for every single person, especially if you belong to the body of faith, the body of Christ, primarily, um, as this is, as I said before, um, the vantage point from which I speak, um, you want to ensure that you are praying regularly. The Bible says to pray without ceasing. So prayer uh, the prayer of a fervent man, the fervent prayer of a, of a righteous man availeth much. And so we understand that prayer is very important. Also, we need to spend time meditating. Um, meditation is important to relieve our stress. Prayer, meditation, and guess what, Mrs. G? Fasting. There is nothing that boosts our immune system better than fasting. Sometimes people think you eat your way to build your immune system, but in actuality, if you fast, and there are different ways to fast, but if you do a prolonged fasting period, so a 12-hour fast between when you last eat before you go to bed and when you wake up and have your first meal, that 12-hour fasting period can be very important in boosting your immune system. And you can also add to that the nutrients that we recommended as a drink to kind of as a, or a tea to kind of keep off the gas, as <laughs> some Jamaicans would say. But during that fasting period, it will be very good to help boost your, um, it will be your innate immune response that gets boosted with the fasting. And for those of you who are not medical minded, that's the white blood cells that will go on the immediate attack of any cells or foreign invaders that come into our bodies. And so that goes into overdrive. So that's very important. Um, vitamin supplements are also important. And I'm going to share with the, with the listeners, with each of you, um, some of those recommendations in a very short while. Um, deep sleep is also important. And it's both quality and quantity of sleep that will build your immune function. And so for some persons, you are awakened by the slightest noise, and so you're not able to get into a deep sleep. Two very important sleep aids I recommend. One is an eye mask. An eye mask that, you, that blocks out the light with, that you can put over your eyes will help to keep the room, especially when you're about to go to sleep, especially if there's any lights around, to keep it dark as possible so that you can benefit from you know, the no light disturbance. Because even through your eyelids, you can still perceive light and that can disrupt your sleep. In fact, it is when the sun comes up 
and the light hits the back of our eyelids or the front of our eyelids that we see that light through our eyelids and should awaken. That's a natural way that we should wake up. Um, the next thing is earplugs. You can invest in some earplugs that will block out, you know, especially if you have a snoring wife or husband. <laughs> My wife doesn't snore, but you know, I, I wish she could say the same of her husband. Um, so earplugs are important to block out the sounds so that you can um, benefit from less disturbance. And that seven to nine hours sleep that is required or recommended um, for optimal health you could probably get away with a little bit less if you're doing those things as well because a deeper quality sleep will give you more recuperative benefits. A hot sauna is important as well. And in Finland, saunas is a way of life there. And it is well established that even though they are a Nordic country and they're in the very cold and northern climates, their rates of infection from respiratory infections and the flus is considerably less than many other places of similar, of similar um, environs. And that's largely as a result of the benefits of a sauna. So why would a sauna be beneficial to anyone? A sauna is beneficial, and there are many studies that support this. So you can look up Finnish studies um, on saunas and the immune system. Well, with saunas, it increases, and these saunas can go up to as high as, you know, 48 degrees Celsius, can go very, very hot. Um, and they can raise the body temperature to 38, 39 degrees um, Fahrenheit, maybe as, as Celsius, <laughs> and maybe as much as 40 degrees Celsius. Now, with a body temperature that high, you're basically inducing within yourself this, a similar effect as what would happen when you have a fever. And so the question is, is a fever good? And so that is also something that we want to ensure that people understand that fevers are not something to break, especially when you have a respiratory infection. It is highly important that you allow a fever to do its job because once your fever goes up, your immune system goes into overdrive and in particular, your innate immune system will ramp up and you'll be able to overcome infections much faster and it is well established and much more effectively with less outcomes of um, persons succumbing to an infection. So that's important. Exercise is also important. Mild exercise to build, um, build up your heart rate and to get a good sweat going is important. So if you're not sweating, then unless you're in an air-conditioned environment, it is, you know, it's, <laughs> you're not exercising vigorously enough or for long enough a duration. So exercise to work up a good sweat and to raise your heart rate um, without doing too much or going too hard. And conscious breathing is also important. And one method I'm going to invite everyone to kind of go on YouTube and look up is called the Wim Hof Method, W-I-M-H-O-F, Wim Hof, two words, is the name of an individual. And that method of breathing is documented on YouTube. It teaches you how to actually breathe that way and helps people to take in deeper breaths and oxygenate themselves even better. A simple deep breathing exercise could be just to ensure that you inhale and you exhale in a ratio of one to two, meaning that however long it takes you to inhale, it should take you twice as long to exhale. Anything else that you would recommend? I know we've talked about um, vitamin D, and a question came in uh, earlier regarding the matter of vitamin D, and that is, we were talking about the role of the sun in getting uh, vitamin D, and so someone wanted to find out, does the sun raise your blood pressure? Because they were concerned about that. Um, if you could reiterate the recommendation concerning vitamin D, and then if you could answer Gregory's question about the blood pressure, Carlene also wanted to find out whether or not it could contribute to skin cancer. Okay. Those are two very powerful questions. All right, so let's talk about vitamin D, and let's answer those questions first, and then we'll go into vitamin D a little bit more specifically. Um, as it relates to raising the blood pressure, I'm not, I, I don't know. I don't know, I can't answer that question whether it definitively raises the blood pressure, but generally speaking, from all the literature that I've read, um, spending five to 10 minutes, five, 15 to 20 minutes in the sun, between the hours of 10 and 3, 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. is more protective than not for most maladies. In fact, vitamin D 
has been found to be one of those what we call a ubiquitous beneficial or benefiter of the human experience. It helps a wide variety of conditions, and that's because vitamin D is a necessary vitamin in gene expression. And so for genes to make proteins for healing the body, uh, vitamin D is essential for many such um, reactions to take place. Um, how about skin cancer? Skin cancer happens when the body is exposed to UVA radiation, which is the, there are two types of UV radiation that comes from the sun, UVA and UVB. UVA is harmful, UVB is protective. However, UVB is more protective than is UVA harmful. So if you're out in the sun without sunblock, you will have access to more UVB radiation than uh, enough UVB radiation to protect you from the UVA damage. However, when you wear sunblock, some, most of the UVB radiation will be blocked and some UVA may still get through. And so it is important that you understand that sunblock may actually increase the incidence of skin cancer, not because of the contents of it, but because of its blocking of the UVB rays. And so that's something to look into as well. The next thing is that even wearing your clothing, even when you're wearing clothing, your clothes itself will block UVB radiation while allowing UVA, depending on how thick or, or thin the material is, to go through. So if you're wearing a thin blouse, for example, your skin underneath the blouse will not have much UVB radiation there, but it, will have, it may have some UVA getting through. So if you're going to be doing this thing that we call sunbathing or um, getting your vitamin D via the sunlight, it is preferred that you have your skin exposed. If you're, let me, let Mrs. G ask her question and then I'll continue. Yes, I'm happy that you have touched on the point of sunscreen because Beverly, indicated that um, she wished that she couldn't or, or didn't have to go outside anymore. She said for many years she had worked outside a lot and still doing so and that caused her face to become darker than it used to be. And so these days she tried using sunscreen but it makes her sweat um, while she's outside. But I'm hearing you say that perhaps you would want to discourage Beverly from using sunscreen for the purpose of getting more UVB rays. Thank you, Mrs. G, and thank you, Beverly, for that question. Um, as far as what we're recommending for sunlight, you have to understand, I'm not saying to spend an hour in the sun every day. So it's not the more the better, because there is an amount that is therapeutic, and then beyond that, it can become harmful. So, what's Bec the so the recommendation is, if you're light in complexion, so if you're, um, you know, from the European type, body type, or skin type, um, one would say that it is better to spend, or for you, you can probably get away with spending uh, 10 to 15 minutes in direct sunlight, and it's not all throughout the year. It is especially when the sun is high enough in the air or in the sky to give you that UVB exposure. Um, in the winter months, it's very difficult to get enough sunlight to, that can give you enough um, vitamin D. But in the summertime, you can get direct vit vitamin D directly from the sun in those northern climates. If it is that you're doing so, you want to make sure that you, if you're in a short sleeve shirt and shorts, uh, you can spend that 10 to 15 minutes. If you spend that much time in direct sunlight, for that period, then what you will realize is that you will get about the equivalent of 3,000 IUs of vitamin D, and we'll talk a little bit about those IUs, international units, a little bit later on, but you'll get about 3,000 IUs of vitamin D um, from sunlight with just your, your, just your arms and legs exposed for 15 minutes for that type of um, skin type. If you're a dark complexion like myself, you will probably need to spend 20 to 30 minutes in the sun. Um, in direct sunlight to get the same benefit because melanin in our skin absorbs the UVB rays and so we don't get the benefit of converting the cholesterol under our skin into the vitamin D. So 
for dark complected persons such as myself, um, you want to spend about 20 minutes to 30 minutes in the sun during that time. I like 10 o'clock in the morning um, because it's, the sun is not too overwhelming and the environment is still a little cooler than in the afternoon sun. So I would re recommend, you know, you try to get it as close to 10 a.m. as possible, especially if you're starting out. And if you're starting out, I don't recommend that you stay in the sun. If you've not been used to being in the sun, don't go spend 20 minutes at first time. Spend five minutes, spend 10 minutes, spend 15 minutes, work your way up. But if you're, you know, a light-complected person, you can see the changes in your skin a lot easier. So the goal is just to get your skin to turn a, a subtle pink. If you're, you know, if you can see pink on your skin, um, I don't see pink on my skin very well, but it will give you a little bit of a blush. Um, but yeah, so that's about <laughs> that's about that for that one. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Doc. I know that we need to move away from the matter of the boosting of the immune system to answer some of our other questions having to do with caring for the elderly and any vulnerable group. Some of the practical things that we can do to safeguard the vulnerable. Um, if you could highlight some of the things that persons can do. Okay. Um, Okay, so when you're caring for somebody who is elderly, um, it's important that we do several things. And it's not just the elderly, because the elderly are not the only vulnerable demographic. And so when we're talking about the vulnerable persons, what we mean by that is those persons for whom contracting COVID-19 will result in a more severe um, out outcome than somebody who is not in that vulnerable group. So the majority of the population, typically if they were to contract COVID-19, will have only a mild illness, maybe up to a moderate illness. But those who are in the vulnerable group will go from moderate to severe in how they respond. And this group of persons will include those who are elderly. So we're talking about persons over 60. Um, the better health that you are in overall, the lower the risk, but with every year that's added, it's added risk um, to the level severity and possible overcoming, being overcome um, by the disease. So what do we do? One thing for the elderly to keep them safe is that during this time, they must be quarantined. Self-quarantine or quarantining them from the rest of the family is important. Um, it is a very challenging thing to suggest, but it's important because if they were to contract it, the outcome can be dire for them. So quarantining themselves is important to be able to prevent the spread. If they live in a multi-person or multi-family home, it is also important that you give them their own space, meaning they need to have their own sleeping quarters, they need to have their own um, bathroom if possible. So if it's two bathrooms in the house, let them use one bathroom all for themselves and, and you use another bathroom. So once somebody is in that vulnerable group, you want to separate yourself from them as much as possible. Um, kids, you have to be aware of kids interacting with a vulnerable group because children, may have a higher likelihood of contracting this disease without showing symptoms or with only very mild symptoms. And so you can have a child that has contracted it and then interact with the older person. And as a consequence of that, end up giving it to that older person. So for the kids, try to keep the kids away from grandma during this time. Um, well, <laughs> you, you get the drift. Um, the vulnerable group needs to supplement with 5,000 IUs, at least 5,000 IUs of vitamin D3. 5,000 IUs of vitamin D3. It's usually in a liquid form that you can just drop into your mouth or drop under your tongue. Um, per day? Per, per day, 5,000 IUs per day. Um, so you can break it up into, 
you know, two two thousands and a one thousand or something like that. Uh, but five thousand IU's per day is important because it will help to bring your blood levels of vitamin D to a level that is what we consider to be protective. And we'll talk about that protective level um, very shortly. We have to reduce their stress as well. And the last and most important thing I would say in interacting with these persons is the issue of double masking. <clears throat> By double masking, I mean the elderly person must wear a mask and you wear a mask. Okay. So that way, if you have to interact with them, let's say you're the caregiver who's going to be caring for them, especially if they can't care for themselves, and you have to be cleaning them, bathing them, and so forth, it is important that you wear a mask during the, the, the exchange because you could possibly have it and transmit it. And so to keep them safe, it is important that you wear a mask. But in the event that there is any um, defectiveness or the mask is defective in any way, or compromised in any way, if they're also wearing a mask, then they're offered some amount of protection as well. It is important that you do not touch the mask, especially the inside of the mask, for the elderly. If it, is, if it comes in a sealed container, then you ensure that they receive it in the sealed container and they open it themselves. If it is not sealed, ensure that no one or nothing touches the inside surface of the mask. And before you handle the mask, you must wash your hands properly, not sanitize your hands with a sanitizer, wash your hands, especially for the recommended two minutes with soap and water. It doesn't have to be warm water, just soap and water. A similar approach when you're dealing with, a similar approach when dealing with um, persons who have already contracted COVID-19. And so in dealing with that demographic of persons, um, you um, employ a similar strategy. Thank you. Employ a similar strategy. However, you have to be a little bit more cautious when you're returning to the general population. So if they have COVID-19, then it is essential that they wear a mask whenever they are going to interact with you. So you must wear a mask as well, but it is essential that they wear a mask. So if it is a situation where you're caring for the elderly and it's only one mask in the house, you wear the mask to care for that vulnerable person. Okay. If it is that there is one mask in the house and you're caring for somebody who has COVID-19, it is essential that they wear the mask. So it's important that the person who has a higher likelihood of spreading the infection wears the mask if you are down to a one mask situation. Total isolation is important. And if you are caring for that person, especially if you're handling their fecal matter or if you're changing them or bathing them, make sure that you're wearing a glove that's disposable. And as soon as you're finished, you dispose of the glove in a single space that doesn't come into contact with anyone else before you wash your hands, before you change your clothes, before you interact with the rest of the population. So I recommend that you have a specific set of clothes that you wear when you're dealing with that person who has the infection. And when you're leaving that space, you remove those clothing, change off into your other, well, shower, change off into your other clothing before you interact with the rest of the house. It's important because you don't want to spread this thing. And next thing is that you want to limit the number of persons caring for this, that elderly person. So if there are multiple people in the house, if it's somebody, that person with COVID rather, if there are multiple persons in the home, make sure that only one person is designated to be the person who is a primary caregiver for that individual. And unless it's absolutely necessary, don't let anyone else care for the person during that time. So these are some things that are important. The last thing I would recommend is opening a bedroom window. Make sure that their room is well ventilated, especially if you're going to be going in there. You don't want to be going into an air-conditioned environment with somebody who is infected with COVID-19 because you don't want to be circulating the air in the event that there is any remnant particles in the air that could spread around. So opening the window and ensuring that there is a fresh flow of, of, of clean, open air through the room. So I would recommend that if you're going to use a fan in the room that you don't have the fan on spinning around the room, that you just put the fan in front of the window with the fan blowing away from the window in one direction only and not blowing toward the person who is sick, um, just to suck into the room that 
fresh ventilated air. Um, that would be some good tips that one could employ. Thank you, Dr. Gardner. I know we are getting to, to the end of the program, but I don't want to miss a question from Mr. Robinson, who wanted to find out, does chiropractic treatment contribute to our immune system's response to any virus, including COVID-19, the coronavirus? Okay, so when we're speaking about chiropractic care and the immune system, one has to understand that the immune system is under the direct control of the nervous system. And chiropractic care is well demonstrated to improve the function of the nervous system. And improved nervous system function theoretically should improve also the immune system function. Is there any evidence of this? Well, if we go back to the in our most recent memories, one of the most deadly plagues that impacted us, the Spanish flu um, that killed 50 million people around the world and infected half a billion people, and these are estimates um, around the world. What happened with chiropractic then? Because chiropractic was an established profession then. Well, there is actual records and evidence chiropractors would go from door to door adjusting their patients because the patients could not come into the office, the ones who were sick. And lo and behold, the ones who were getting adjusted started to survive. And the ones who were under conventional care were dying. And so this is well documented. It's not just for chiropractic. It's also for osteopathy, which also deals with alignments of the spine, as well as um, homeopathy. And so these types of approaches were shown to be beneficial considerably more so than standard me measures back then for treating persons with uh, respiratory infection. And so the answer to that question is, based on the historical evidence, it is suggested that chiropractic care should improve immune system function. Thank you, Dr. Gardner. As we come to the close of the program, do you have any final words that, uh, for, the, um, for our listeners concerning the matter of um, COVID-19, uh, their preparedness, and so on? Well, I saved the best for last because of how critical this piece of information is. We're going to talk about two things, vitamin C and vitamin D. These are two vitamins that are game changers as it relates to COVID-19 specifically. So when we're talking about vitamins and respiratory infections, it is important that persons understand that, you know, it's not the A and Bs that you want to get. It's the Cs and Ds that you want to get to build your immune system, to fight a respiratory infection. And so... Vitamin C is well documented to be not only effective at protecting one against dire outcomes with a viral infection, but once somebody already has a viral infection, it can help them to beat it, to recover from it. Now, this sounds like a lofty claim. So what's the evidence for this? Well, information came out and it was labeled as fake news initially when it came out that in china the hospitals in china some of them were using intravenous ascorbic acid or vitamin c to infuse it into the very sick patients and what they found there was one study one particular hospital where they had i think it was 138 patients that they were testing in this group 50 of which got the vitamin C infusions. None of the 50 died. Okay. And of the 50, when they looked at the entire, the length of stay in the hospital, it was five to seven days shorter stay. I believe it's five to seven. It's either five to seven or three to five. Um, shorter stay in the hospital on average than those who did not get the vitamin C. And there's an established protocol for doing this. And it is my hope, it is my sincere hope that any medical doctor listening or any medical professional listening will 
either do their own look into this or can contact me and I'll show you where I found that information that actually outlines what steps to do in a hospital setting if you're going to infuse somebody with vitamin C. So it was fake news until it was reported in the New York Post that in New York City just a few days ago, they started to use vitamin C injections for the patients that were um, very sick with COVID-19. After this was considered fake news. Okay. And so sometimes when it comes to a novel situation like this, it is important that persons realize that, you know what, we don't have all the answers. And sometimes something that might seem you know, like it might not benefit anyone, it might not make any sense. One has to recognize that it's not about making sense. One, you have to say, will it cause harm? And since it will not cause harm, if there's nothing else that the person is responding to, why not try as a last ditch effort, something that you don't know whether it will work or not? There is ample evidence to support the use of vitamin C in the treatment not prevention, in the treatment of those with chronic diseases, including respiratory infections. And the, one of the doctors, um, see if I can remember his name, Robert Fulton Cathgard III, <laughs> it is the name of the person, Robert Fulton Cathgard III, Cathcard III. Um, look up his name and you'll see the data for it. Um, he made a statement that he has not found one virus that, can, that vitamin C cannot eliminate or at least ameliorate. Okay. Now, with the protocol for people staying at home, this is what you do. You will take two grams of vitamin C four times a day. That is eight grams of vitamin, D, vitamin C for an adult. Okay. If it's a child, you want to start with about half of a an adult dose, or depending if it's an infant, it's used body weight ratios. Now the way you do vitamin C is this. You take vitamin C up to what is known as bowel tolerance, which means that you will take it until you get to diarrhea. When you have diarrhea, you keep increasing the dose until you get to diarrhea. So you start at two grams four times a day and increase by one gram every day until you start to have diarrhea. When you have diarrhea, that means you're at the level that is required for you to fight that disease. You bring it down a little bit to the next lower safe dose and you work with that. And if you get diarrhea again after that, you reduce it and reduce it and reduce it. You do that for at least a week let the symptoms subside, then you reduce it and see if the symptoms will stay at bay. That's if somebody already has the disease. Okay. Vitamin D is not necessarily the greatest at, um, at correcting or um, fighting the infection, or it's not the word I was looking for. But anyhow, vitamin D is better at defense, preventing somebody from catching it, not overcoming the disease once you already have it. So vitamin D is demonstrated to be very protective for any respiratory infection, especially upper respiratory infections. And so how does vitamin D work? The sunlight converts the the cholesterol under the skin, and that cholesterol goes through a couple changes, first through the liver and then through the kidneys to turn it into the active form of vitamin D that can be either used to store for calcium in the bones or to fight infections by upregulating your immune system through turning on the gene response for immunity. However, every cell in the body has vitamin D receptors, and that is how vitamin D can solve so many issues. Not only can every cell, does every cell have vitamin D receptors, there is one set of cells in particular that's also interesting. It is the cells that line your sinus passages or your respiratory tract. The cells of your respira respiratory tract is unique amongst all cells other than your kidneys. In that, the cells of your respiratory tract also contains um, the enzyme responsible for the final conversion of vitamin D to the active form which means that vitamin D, which circulates in your blood in the inactive form most places, will, when it gets to the 
airways or the sinus passages can by those cells be activated to the active form and then absorbed by the very cells to fight what or to help the body to overcome or to protect it from whatever is invading it as far as a respiratory infection. It is well documented to prevent persons from catching the flu as opposed to um, not taking it. This is not the flu. We've not experienced this particular one before. But if it can stop many other respiratory infections, it might be a good idea to boost your content, your, your system, with enough vitamin D. How much vitamin D would we say is good? Um, there's a blood test that you will do, um, hydroxy um, vitamin D. It's a specific vitamin D test. I think it's 25 hydroxy vitamin D or cholecalciferol. I'm not sure if that's exactly it. However, the vitamin D test, you go and the range that is found to be effective at preventing inf infections from a respiratory um, virus is uh, 40 to 60 nanograms per deciliter okay. or per milliliter. It's 40, 40 to 60. If you spend... 15 minutes in the sun, that will give you about 3,000 IUs of vitamin D, which will give you about 40, 40 nanograms. So that's why the 15 minutes in the sun is important, right? Um, if you're taking vitamin D as a supplement, um, I would prefer that you're on the higher end of that spectrum. You want to be on the end of closer to 60, even 70, 80, or 90 nanograms. And to do that, you will want to do a full sunbathing for not fully nude, but take off your shirt, have on a shorts only or a, or a bathing suit, and get the direct sunlight on the front and on the back. Um, and you can do 10 minutes on the front and 10 minutes on the back so that you're not overly exposed on one side. And this will give you about two, about 20,000 IUs if you're doing a full sun bath. Now, as far as oral supplementation is concerned, you can't get toxic exposures of, vi of vitamin D from the sun, but you can get toxic exposures from a, an oral supplement. But 10,000 vitamin D is known to be safe for up to six months okay. of daily supplement of 10,000 IUs of vitamin D every single day. It's known to be non-toxic. There are some persons that will supplement up to 50,000 um, IUs, but I would say certainly what we know to be 100% safe from the literature is five to 10,000 IUs. If you are in the vulnerable group, I will say that you want to shoot for five to 10,000 IUs of vitamin D every single day as a natural course to prevent you from contracting this infection or to lower your likelihood of contracting it, even if exposed. Thank you so much, Dr. Gardner. Thank you all for joining us for our very first uh, virtual town hall uh, here at Gardner Chiropractic and Neurology. On Tuesday, we go back to our regular program on Radio Jamaica 94 FM. You may know that that's Back to Health. So you may join us um, on Back to Health this Tuesday at 8 p.m. on Radio Jamaica 94 FM. And we'll go back to our regular program. And of course, you can see us live in studio just as you are seeing us here and um, send your questions at that time. Okay, so we'll see you then. Bye-bye.